every man, every woman, every young person in this congregation. I need you to be a warrior for God. I want to share with you this morning a short message called Growing Together. And when we look at the growth process, we all must grow as individuals, but something amazing happens when we join ourselves with other people that are growing. We grow more together than we could ever grow by ourselves. When you look at the word church, a lot of times people think, oh, it's an organization, it's a denomination, it's this, it's that. When you look at the biblical word for church, it really means a group of people. And it means two things. It means individuals that were living in darkness or living away from the will of God, they change their life and they live God's will for their lives. And it also means people that were living individual lives who were brought into community. So when you look at what a church is, it's a group of individuals who were once living away from God in their own plans, living in darkness, which means fear, doubt, confusion, not knowing what to do with life. But then God brings them into his family and they're joined together. So they come out of darkness and individuality to the light of God, the plan of God, and the family of God. And one thing I love about that, this means it doesn't matter where you're at. If you're in Rockaway, New Jersey, if you're somewhere else in the world, when we come together with God and together with God's people, we grow together better. We grow together faster. We can do things that we cannot do on our own. You see, the Christian walk was never meant to be alone. It was always meant to be in community. And I want to encourage you today, you may be here and you might be saying, well, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm learning about this Jesus thing. I'm learning about church. I'm learning, I don't even know what that's all about. And about 20 years ago, that's where I was when I walked into Christ Church. I didn't, I was distant from God. I, I was far away from God, but I, I knew a couple of things. I wanted to know God and I wanted to be with people. So you're welcome here at Christ Church. And if you're watching us online from anywhere around the world, you're welcome here to Christ Church online. And we pray also that you'll get local people to connect with. I want to share a, a little story with you, uh, how these principles of growing together works. Yes, it works in the church, but it also works just in the world because God's laws, whether or not they're applied by Christians or other people, there's still a benefit to them. How many people saw the Olympics? Did anybody see the Olympics? All right. One of a, a, a great victory for the United States was the women's gymnastics team. How many people saw it? There they are, our ladies, right? Girl power, right? So I've, I've got a wife and four daughters, so I'm, I'm big on girl power. <laughs> Otherwise known as survival. <laughs> so, but when you look at these young ladies, they won many individual gold medals, but they did something that I don't think the Americans ever, they won the world, uh, the, the overall gold medal for, the, for everybody. So what you see is you see individuals who are passionate about being the best. Individuals that said, you know what, I'm going to work hard. I want to be a champion. And then they, after they did that, they chose to connect themselves with others so that they could do things that they could never do on their own. So you see two things. Individuals committed to growth, committed to excellence. Then they join together with others for, for community greatness and to do something they could not do on their own. Guess what? That's the same thing God wants to do here at Christ Church. He's looking for individuals that say, you know what? No matter what, I want to be a spiritual champion. I want to get in God's word every day. I want to grow. I want to live out God's plan, God's purpose. I want to be a spiritual champion if it's only me. But with the same mindset of, I don't want to do it alone. I'm going to go for it myself. But you know what? I want to connect myself with other people who have the same like mindset. And I want to do this together as a community and as a family so that we can grow and do amazing things that changes the world. Uh, I want to go to a scripture it's in Acts 2, verse 42. And it gives us a picture of what a world-class church looks like. 
If, you, if you're using a blue Bible, that's what we have here for you at the church, you can go to page 772 if you're just learning about the God's Word and you're learning about the Bible. We want you to be able to turn there quickly. And in Acts 2, it paints a picture of what a world-changing church looks like. And when I share with you about growing together, you see, we cannot get comfortable. I've got to continually challenge myself not to be comfortable with what God has done so far because we serve a God that wants to do more. We need to receive for ourselves, but right now there are 7 billion people on planet Earth, and the majority of them right now are disconnected from God. So we've got to grow for ourselves so that we can help reach others. Acts 2, beginning at verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It paints a picture of what a world-class church looks like. It's not just people that get together on a Sunday. It's not people that once in a while think about, well, what does God want me to do or not do? It, it's, a, it's a picture of a healthy, growing church, which is made up of healthy, growing people. Each person taking ownership of their own personal growth and saying, you know, I need to grow every day. I need to get a little bit better every day. I need to learn about God a little bit more each day. And when you do that, it's amazing how fast you progress. See, people that are dedicated to learning God's word on a daily basis. You see, it says that uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And you might say, well, you know, I, I don't, there's no apostles. I don't see Peter running around. I don't see John. I don't see James running around. But the apostles' teaching is recorded in God's Word. Every single day, you can learn from the apostles' teaching through God's Word. A world-changing church, they meet together in large groups, they meet together in small groups. They're generous with two things, and I love this. They're generous with their possessions, but they're also generous with their love. Few people think about being generous with their love. You know, and one thing I've learned about ministry, I don't have to be the most gifted. I don't have to be the most talented. I don't have to be the best this or best that. When I love people, God moves. When I open my heart and I care for people, it invites God into the situation so that I'm not working in my power. I'm working in God's power. The word said that God is love. It's not that he just loves. He wants us to love. He is love. So when we start walking and giving away God's love, God's power is there. And also, a world-changing church is constantly reaching new people. It amazes me how many people I talk to, they're looking for God. They're searching for God. They want God. If we watch the news and we listen to people and we hear that all these people are anti-religious and these people are this and that, you know what, and those people are out there, but how many of you know the people with the biggest mouths get the most attention? But the average person's not a big mouth. The average person's quiet, going about their life, but they're looking for answers. And if you're a follower of Christ, you have that answer. I want to share a, a plan that we've been putting together, the discipleship process of Christ Church. You see, as a church, we have many great things, but one of the areas we want to grow in is our ability for uh, disciples to grow, and we want to give a better plan. So what we're introducing this month, you should have gotten a, a postcard when you came in, it has the word grow on it. And the letters there, each letter means something that if you put this into practice, it's going to help you be spiritually strong. We're calling it the grow steps to spiritual fitness. See, I'm, I'm somebody, I like physical fitness, but as I get older, physical fitness gets a little bit more challenging. Right? I, I've got less desire to do more work. But I need to do more work to get to where I want to stay. That doesn't even make sense, right? To get to where I want to stay. But I say it like that because how many of you know it's work to get to where you, <laughs> where you currently are as you get older. 
But spiritual fitness is the same thing. The more diligent we are with that, the easier it is to maintain it. So first is the G. What can I do to grow all the time to stay steadfast? It's very simple. Go to God daily. When you go to God daily and you spend a quiet time with God and you start to uh, really focus for a, a part of your day, it may be early in the morning, it may be late at night, it doesn't matter. But for me, if I don't spend a significant amount of time with God in the morning, it's like my whole day changes. It's like the difference when I go outside, is, is it sunny or is it cloudy? You know, if I have my quiet time with God, it's, uh, you know, not, not physically, but spiritually, it's like my day is good. If I don't have my quiet time, it's like walking through a cloudy day. So this is what happens. And in Acts 2.42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to prayer. And as I said before, every day you can read God's word and every day that you can pray. And one of the things that Jesus did, he spent a lot of his time alone with God. If we look at Mark 1, verse 35, it paints a picture. And I've had to remind myself of this every time I read a scripture like this. If Jesus needed to spend time with God the Father, how much more do I need to spend time? If Jesus said, you know what, I'm stressed out, I need to go pray. If Jesus, God in flesh, was stressed out at times by the amount of things that he had to do, because though he was God, he, he was flesh in the body. His flesh felt stress. His flesh felt hunger. His flesh felt fatigue. And what, how he combated that was he spent time with God. Mark 1.35 paints this picture. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. See, it's in studying God's word that we get answers. It's in praying to God that we get God's presence, his leading, his direction, his peace, and his joy. And for me, the best time is early in the morning. And when we look at a quiet time, we're going to see that you need to pick the time that's best for you. But could you imagine, what would your life be like if you had greater faith? What would your life be like if you had greater peace? What would your life be like if God was directing you instead of you just kind of trying to figure it out along the way? One of the prayers I learned is this. It's not asking God why, because a lot of people walk around, why God, why God, why God, and they don't get an answer. But the question that I've learned is, God, what do I do with this? And when you have your daily quiet time, God begins to speak to you. And I learned this as a young Christian. When I first came to Christ Church in 1997, I had no church background. I had never read the Bible. I didn't even know what a pastor was. I just didn't know. People said, well, where did you grow up? New Jersey. <laughs> but what happened to me is if I had a question... I would get in there every day and I would read God's word. I still remember the, the old couch that I had. I would, I would sit on that couch or lay on that couch and I would, I would read God's word. And there was times where I knew I didn't have the strength to do what I needed to do. But then I would read Philippians 4.13 and it, it would say, God, it, it says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And then I would go through life and I would have stressful situations and decisions to make and I lacked wisdom and I, I would be on my couch and I would read God's word. And it says, for any of you who lack wisdom, ask for it and God will give it to you liberally without finding fault. And I said, you know what, I need that because I had a lot of faults. But I found out that God, when I come to God and I ask him for wisdom, he doesn't hit me with a list of things. Well, I'm not going to give you wisdom because you did this and you did this and you did this and you did that. God says that when you come to him and ask for wisdom, he gives it to you without finding fault. And I needed that. I needed that comfort. I needed to know that God wasn't angry at me. Because a lot of times people tell you God's angry at you like he's mad. God is not angry at you. He is not mad at you. He loves you. Just like our children, my wife and I, we have four children. If my child comes to me with a problem, I'm not mad at them. I want to help them. If they have a question, I don't look at them and go, what? What? You don't know that? I give them the answer. My goal is to help my child grow and, and be successful. Same thing with God. Maybe you're lacking peace in your life. God's word teaches, teaches us that he will give us the peace that surpasses understanding. What that scripture means is you could understand God, God giving you peace when your problems are this big. 
You can understand God giving you peace when your problems are that big. You might even be able to understand God's peace when he gives you this. But there's no way if your problems are up here that God can give you peace. You can't understand that. But his word says, you know what? It doesn't matter what your problems look like. It doesn't matter if they're here, 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 here. God will give you peace that surpasses understanding. It means that you don't have to understand it. God will give it to you. Let me get a little bit bolder. It doesn't even have to make sense to you. You could be like, God, this makes no sense. My life is crazy. The situation's crazy. This person's crazy. And instead of saying, why, 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 you go to God and he gives you peace. Instead of saying, why, 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 God gives you the strength. And saying, I don't understand how to get out of this and you're crying. And God gives you the wisdom. But how do you get it? You get it by being in God's word on a daily basis. You get it by being in God's presence on a regular basis. Now, when uh, people do studies in uh, Willow Creek, which is a big church, it was, one, it was famous for uh, being a seeker-friendly church, which means they would, they would do just about anything to get people to tell them about God. And a lot of people would say, oh, I want this God, I want this. But after a time, they started looking and saying, well, we're getting a lot of people to come to our church, but are they really being followers of Christ? Are they being discipled? And after they were known as the best in the country, they, they were honest with themselves. They did a study, and they said, are we, are we raising up mature Christians? And the answer to that was no. So instead of saying, wait a second, we're the best at this, they said, you know what? We need to grow in this area. And they did a study. And after they did this study, uh, though they were very successful, they recognized the weakness. And when they did the study, they said that the number one thing in growing disciples is daily quiet time. And they did this with like thousands of churches. It wasn't about what denomination you're from. Is your pastor a great preacher? Is the worship leader a great worshiper? And all of those things are good. But the number one factor was, does the person spend daily quiet time with God? That was it. George Barna, another famous researcher, started to ask people, well, what causes you to grow? And, and the two studies, they matched up. People said, when I pray, I grow. When I read God's word, I grow. When I spend alone time with God, I grow. And the next thing is this. That's the number one factor, but the number one thing that keeps people from having quiet time is busyness. Now, part of that's our culture. We live in a super busy culture. We live in the Northeast. Me personally, I've got a wife, I've got four children, work hard, all of these things. So I have to fight to make sure I keep my daily quiet time because if I don't, if I'm not purposeful about it, it doesn't happen. But here are some things that we do every day. Ask yourself these questions. Do I look at email every day? Do I look at Facebook every day? Do I tweet? Do I watch soap operas? Let me help the soap opera people. Whatever was happening 20 years ago is the same thing that happened today. <laughs> no, true story. My, I had a roommate in college. Don't ask me why. He was an offensive lineman. He was a guard. But he, he saw this big burly guy watch like Days of Our Lives or one of those things. And I hadn't seen, I, I watched it a couple times with him like 20 years ago. And then I'm in a deli or someplace. Or I was eating someplace. And, and they have Days of Our Lives on or whatever one it was. And it's the same people having the same fights with the same people. And they look the same. I don't know how that happens. That's a lot of Botox. But the reality of it is we have time for that. We have time for sitcoms. We have time for sports. And I'm not making it like, you know, I'm not saying you can't do all these things, but if our time is eaten up by those things, we won't have time for God. And I want to say this, that even, even good things can keep us from God. There was a time I had wanted a puppy. I had wanted a dog for a long time. I've told this story. I went through a five-month process. Somebody gave me this dog. His name is Luther. So say hi to Luther. Now, this was during a, a time of my life. I was stressed out. I, I was not really having my quiet time. So what ha usually what happens is you get stressed out. You get too busy. So you have less quiet time. So you spend less time with God, less time in God's presence, so you feel the stress and all the problems more. Anyway, so I get this dog, and all of a sudden, I don't, I don't have 20 minutes to spend with God, but I have an hour in the morning to train the dog. And when I come home from work, I got 20 minutes to walk him, and then I, then I got an hour at night to, to spend time with this dog. And, and one day, God just literally called me on. He spoke, he spoke to my spirit, and he was, God was like, really? He's like, you got two and a half hours for a dog? And you don't have 10 minutes for me. So we have to be careful. But the result of it 
Is a dog a good thing? Is Luther a good thing? I mean, how many of you like Luther? I, I'm, you know, I love Luther. But the thing about it is this. I was ignoring God over a dog. And some of you, if I took away your cell phone and you couldn't tweet or Facebook, some, you'd have a heart attack within a half hour. But all of a sudden, if I say quiet time, you get, oh, who are you to judge me? You can't call me. Just saying. So anyway, so we have to plan this time. So how do you do this quiet time? Number one, there's a couple steps that you can do to increase uh, your quiet time. The first thing is this, choose a place. These are not rules, these are guidelines. It's not like this is Bible and you have to do it at this time. But choose a place, choose a time. For me, if I don't go in my kitchen for 30 minutes in the morning, chances are I'm not going to have a quiet time. Because once the kids start getting up, I get busy, I go to work, the phone calls, all those other stuff, no soap operas. But what happens is my day gets eaten up. But choosing a best place, a best time. And that's best for you. That, that for me, I, I'm up early, so my best time is in the morning. For my wife, my wife's more of, a, more of a nighttime person, so sometimes she spends her quiet time at night. One is not better than the other. They're just different. But the bottom line is we need to spend that time. What do I do when um, I have a quiet time? You read the Bible. You read God's Word. You pray. You can write down things. You can highlight things. You can take notes. You can memorize Scripture. You can do all of these things so that it, it builds you up each and every day. And as, as part of this, it, it's, it's a daily habit. Say that with me. Say daily habit. And if you do that every day, you get to grow every day. And to quote John Piper, he's a famous, if you're still wrestling with this whole Twitter and Facebook thing and you don't want to give it up, John Piper writes this. He says, one of the greatest uses of Twitter and Facebook will be to prove that prayerlessness was not from a lack of time. So if we're not praying, if we're not in God's word, at the end of the day, I think it's a choice. And it's a choice that we can make either way. As a church, one of the things we're going to be doing beginning next week is, is starting new life classes. New life classes are for people that just gave their life to Christ or people that are new to Christ church. And guess what? They're also open to anyone who just wants to be part of it. So next week at 1040, uh, 1045 and 115 here at the church, we'll have our first session. And that session will be on how to have a daily quiet time. So if, if you're here and you're like, I want to learn on this, I want to grow a little bit in this area, you can come to that class, and by the time you leave that, you'll, you'll be able to figure out how to do this, how to plan this, how to organize this, because we want to grow. We want to grow individually. We want to grow as a church. And the G stands for go to God daily. The next is R. R is rally together. All right, when you look at Jesus' life, he did two things that are recorded in the Bible on a regular basis. The first was he spent a lot of time alone with God. The second was this. He spent a lot of time with 12 people. This is a small group. So though he talked to a lot of people, he did a lot of different things, he spent the majority of his time with 12 people. And those 12 people changed the world. In Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Verse 36 says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So by meeting together, you start to take the things that you learned by studying God's word. You start to take the things you learned in prayer and apply them. You see, our faith is meant to be walked out together. There's a big difference between having patience when you're by yourself and having patience with others. I'm a very patient person by myself. You start introducing a bunch of other people to me, you start putting conflict in my life, you start this person saying, you didn't do this and you need to do this. How many of you know all of a sudden I'm not such a patient person? So it's in community, it's in relationship where we get to learn, out, learn to live out God's principles. The best way at Christ Church and the easiest way to connect with a small group of people is to join a small group. Many of us don't know this. There's over a hundred small groups here at Christ Church. You have a hundred different opportunities to get involved. And one of our goals is that everyone at Christ Church either joins or leads a small group. For you, joining a group, it means you get involved, a life group. They meet in different people's houses throughout different areas of, of uh, our communities. So if you want to, you can pick those. 
life activity groups are based on activity. So maybe uh, something like that. We have groups that go hiking together. We've had groups that uh, work out together. We've had groups that fly airplanes together. We've had all kinds of groups. But in that, they build tight relationships. They have spiritual conversations, and they grow in that. The way that you can do that is simply you go online at any time. Go to ChristChurchUSA.org, and you can register for a group. And also, some of you are saying, you know, I don't know if I want to be a part of a group because you feel God tugging on your heart to lead a group. Sometimes we look at it and we go online and we say, there's not a group in my area. Maybe you need to start a group. Or you might say, you know what, I feel like I'm kind of, I don't want to just go and sit and learn, uh, but I feel like I, there's something more that I need to do. And God is tugging on your heart to lead a group. And when you lead a group, you get to help, you get, you help to get to people work through life issues. And I want to share a couple things about my experience in life groups. When I first started, I remember my first life group was in Montclair. My life group leader was named Timmy. And I still remember having a lot of questions, a lot of concerns. I was trying to figure out what this Christian thing was like. And I didn't have the opportunity to get all my questions answered in church because we go to church, we leave, and those type of things. But I still remember the day when I was sitting in Timmy's kitchen and I stayed so long, he began to iron his shirt for the next day. So how, how many of you know that's too long? I can still picture Timmy. He's just, what do you want, Jack? What, what's your question? And he's ironing his shirt. He's starching it and this and that. But I had some needs. Sometimes we look for Sunday morning to meet all our needs, and it can't. There's just not the dynamics for it. But he began to iron. He began to talk to me, and we had small talk. And then he began to ask me some serious questions. And when I gave him the answers, how many of you know he turned the iron off? He said, all right, I got to talk to this young guy. But it was at that time where I was making decisions. Do I really want to follow God? If I'm in this relationship, is this relationship going to take me to where I want to go? Or do I need to cut it off? Maybe I'm, I had this habit or that habit, and God was calling me out of those habits to have better habits. But it was in a life group where I learned to do this. And it wasn't long before I was at the Maxwell's house in Milburn, and they were trying to get me to be their assistant. I didn't even know what an assistant was. They just saw something inside of me that said, you're going to be a leader. I didn't figure it all out. But guess what? The next year, I started leading a group in Bloomfield. Then I started leading a group in Montclair. The only problem with that one, it was at a, a, at a woman's house, and she was kind of old. And, and she said, you know, you can have as many teenagers here as you want, uh, but they can't touch anything. <laughs> so where I come from, it's not a party till something's broken. So, you know, that, that sort of relationship really didn't last too long. And we moved up the street on Valley, Valley Road. Uh, but an interesting thing happened. Over the course of a year or two, we saw 70 kids come to that life group. See, when we talk about outreach, one of the ways uh, that, we, that we do outreach into the communities is we ha invite people to our life groups, and people come to them. P not everybody's ready to come to church, but sometimes they'll come to a person's house. And my last story about uh, life groups is in 2014, when I transitioned out of being a youth pastor into being an associate pastor, one of the first things I did was started a life group in Wharton. And I just felt led to do it, the same way some of you today, God is calling you to do it, and, and you know that you need to. And the, the interesting thing was, uh, it was a bilingual group. The only problem is I don't speak any Spanish. Anyway, so during the course of the year, we had five people, ten people. We got up to 30, 40 people because everybody from the community was hungry from God. And here's the thing. You might say, well, how did you lead a bilingual group? Uh, you don't even speak any Spanish. If God calls you to do something, it doesn't matter what you know, what you don't know. If you start to be obedient and you follow God, God will make a way. And here's the thing. I don't know Spanish, but I love Spanish people. And I got a thing for empanadas. I got my first amen. <laughs> so, but we build genuine relationships in small groups. And as I talked about how uh, small groups help us c connect with the community, that brings me to the next letter, the O. It's an outward focus. See, it's great that God calls us together on Sunday mornings to worship, to learn in his word, but at the end of the day, it's to train us and equip us to bring God's word and God's love outside of the church walls. There's an outward focus. And you may say, how do I get involved in the community? And many of you actually probably are. You can do two things with our outward focus. Number one, get involved in something that's going on in the community. While you're there, is number two, share your faith journey with people. Encourage people to come to church. Encourage people in the Lord. And, and it doesn't necessarily, so we limit God sometimes when we say, well, for me to work in the church, 
I've got to do something in the church building. But that's not it. God wants us to bring his love, his purpose outside the church walls. Maybe you'll be a coach. Maybe you'll be a tutor. Maybe you can be an ESL teacher. Maybe you can help people with finances. Maybe you can mentor people. Maybe you can babysit people. You want to know a good ministry? Help out mothers with little kids. I don't know a mother that has a couple little kids that wouldn't like some help. Raising little kids is tough. You might say, well, I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to teach. Do you know how to help people? Do you know how to love people? Do you know how to care for people? And it's amazing the stories that I hear from people that say, you know what? I was helping this person cook. I was helping this person clean this house. But in the midst of it, I shared the love of Christ with them. And they received the Lord. So we have to be outward focused because God doesn't want us to keep what we have. He wants to share it with other people. And if you're saying, well, I don't know how to share my faith. I don't know how to do that. Today, after service, at 1.15 in the fellowship hall, we have a, a little conversation. It's a 30-minute conversation called sharing your story. If you go there, you'll learn a couple quick things on how to connect with people, what to say to people, and how to do it in a conversational way. We're not asking you to walk up to a stranger on the street. We're asking you to share your story with people that you already have in your life, people that you've earned trust with, people that respect what you have to say. They're all around you. We want to help you share your faith journey with them so that they can begin a faith journey of their own. So we went through a th couple letters here. We said G. Do you remember what G is? Go to God daily. Have that daily quiet time. The R, rally together. It means join together. Either join or lead a small group. O, outward focused. You see, it's not just about me and what I can receive. Does God want to give you a lot? Absolutely. But God gives to us so that we could give to others. The last one is this, the W, worship together weekly. It's so important that we worship together weekly. What do we do that? We come to church each week and we bring friends. When we worship together weekly, there's something that happens as a large group that is different than what happens when we have alone time with God. There's something different that happens when we join in a small group. For me, learning to worship happened in a large group. A lot of times people say, well, how do you hear the voice of God? How are you led by God? I remember God speaking to me most when I started to worship in a large crowd. I don't know what it was, but I felt the presence of God. I felt the leading of God. Sometimes you're asking God for questions. And I'm not saying you're, God is speaking to you with a voice, but you're asking God for a question. What do I do with this? He just leads you in a certain direction. He lets you know. He brings a scripture to you. Sometimes he speaks to my heart, and I know it's God. And a lot of times you just feel God's presence. And especially if you're learning how to do that, it, for some reason it's easier at times to do when we worship together. And it's an, also an opportunity to bring our friends and the statistics are amazing. It's like 80% of people said that if a friend invites them, they'll come. And we're so afraid because we listen to the news and we listen to people that, oh, people don't want God and people don't want religion. It's, it's not like that. If we ask people to join us, they often do. I want to end with this scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Hebrews 10 Verse 25, as we look at joining together. Yes, God is calling us to go to him daily. He's calling us to rally together. He's calling us to have an outward focus. And then worshiping together. Because every time we come together, God does something powerful. Hebrews 10, verse 24 says, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. When you look at this one scripture, it teaches us the value of getting together. It also shows us the reality that there's things that will pull us away from meeting together. There's things, there's obstacles, the busyness of life that will keep us. But when we do join together, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love. When we get together, we're able to feel God's love, we're able to feel the love of others, and we're able to share it with others. 
Just last night, I was at the East Campus, and an amazing thing happened. At the end of service, two people committed to following the Christ, and one of the persons came up to me afterwards, and they looked at me, and they said something that I didn't expect. They said, I'm lonely. This person was well-educated. They had it all together. They looked good on the outside, but things had happened in their life. They were lonely. God has never called us to be lonely. That's why a church, it's people that are called out of individuality together. And when we're together, we thrive, we grow. When we're alone, we wither. Um, doctors, and they do studies, and they say people that are isolated and alone, it hurts them emotionally, it hurts them physically, and there's even a more increased mortality rate. Because being alone is something that God never called us to do. He wants us to spur on each other, to be together, and to love each other, to encourage one another. How many of you have too much encouragement in your life? I don't know about you, but it seems everywhere I go, everybody's just critical here and fix this and change this and do that. Am I the only one? It's like the world magnifies everything that's wrong. The world magnifies everything that's broken. The world magnifies all these things. But God says, when we come together, I want you to encourage one another. I want you to build each other up towards good deeds, towards love. And this is what happens every week. And as I spoke to this other, other uh, person last night, they said, what do I do during the week? Because I, f I, feel like a, I feel like a powerhouse on Sunday and I dwindle all week until next Sunday again. And the reality is, remember that, we all leak. So we need to not only come together every week, but follow these growth principles throughout the week. I wanna pray with you before we go. Every man, every woman, every young person in this congregation, I need you to be a warrior for God.